And the first line to her story is, and to the book is every marriage has its secrets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like that, that's my way of saying, come on in reader. Come Let's go. In, <laughs> Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview with our guest, John Searles. We are going to be talking about his latest novel, Her Last Affair. Now, I got to give you some background. When we had our office in New York, John and I would often cross paths on the street in front of our office. We were 250 West 57th. He was over at the Hearst Tower and we would dish. We would dish, we'd stand on the street, we'd have fun, we'd laugh. And it was completely fun. So I haven't seen John in a while. So I'm looking forward to dishing today. And you guys get to be part of the dish, which is going to be incredibly fun knowing John. So we're going to catch up just like that. So welcome, John. Thanks for joining us today. It's so great to see you again. And it, it is true, everyone. We would run into each other on 57th Street. Sometimes it would be a therapy session <laughs> about, our, about our lives in five minutes. Uh, sometimes it would be just quick bit of gossip and a lot of times just a, a big hug and a and a really good laugh and it always felt good so um it's funny whenever I walk down 57th street I expect to see you and when you're not there I feel like this little heartbreak inside so it's like not there it's not there anymore it's not there so it's been a long time between books for you and you've had a lot happen over these last couple of years so let's do a little fill-in because it starts with one really crazy story um well so you know, I've written three books and published them. And for years, I was books editor in many different edit editorial positions at Cosmopolitan Magazine. And I did books for the Today Show. And life was great. And was starting a new book. And then our apartment, where I am now, it's rebuilt. But our apartment burned down uh, at the hands of an arsonist who fled the country, as you do when you burn someone's apartment down. And this is my advice to everyone watching. Check your fire insurance. It's very important, I've learned. Uh, but it it really, the story of how it happened, if you really want to hear it, um, I met a neighbor a couple doors down and he had a girlfriend and this is my understanding of it. They would argue all the time. People would hear them. Amazon was, uh, not Amazon, Alexa was frequently the center of their arguments as in Alexa, call 911. No, Alexa, <laughs> don't call 911. I'm like, can't you call 911 yourself? You have to have Alexa do it. And so, what I'm told, because we were away when the fire happened, thankfully, is that she caught him in bed with another woman, what I heard here. And then the next night when he was out, she came in with, got into his apartment, took a butcher knife, stabbed, like attacked his flat screen TV, slashed his furniture, slashed his artwork, took all his clothes out onto the terrace and uh, lit it on fire. And then it, the roof blew off the place. He also had three propane space heaters illegal out on the terrace that you're not supposed to have. Then it tore through the next apartment and then it made it to ours. And it's a, we live in these um, beautiful, they're small, cozy, but super charming duplexes in the West Village. And it, um, our ceiling and roof upstairs collapsed, our staircase, everything. The fire department came and it was flooded, smoke damage, it was ruined. And I, Carol, I'm such a like, you know, I'm like a scrappy kind of person who made my whole life, like everything I worked hard for. So I remember coming up here, it was a crime scene. They wouldn't let us up. Like, like I convinced them to let me up here. There was one corner of the living room, this little corner that was normal, untouched. And I was like, okay, well, we'll just hang some plastic sheets. We'll sleep on the fold out sofa. It's going to be fine. And the fire chief said, son, you don't have a roof over your head. <laughs> And this air is toxic. You cannot sleep here. And I was like, oh, I guess he's kind of right. I mean, it was really, it was destroyed. And so we bounced from people's, from hotel rooms to the kindness of strangers, friends who took us in and then their spare bedrooms and a lot of heartbreak. It's really hard to, to lose your home. And right. in the day and age of natural disasters where many people do and the poor people of Ukraine right now are experiencing this on a much greater level losing their homes it's just you know a hard experience to go through and I, i'm not, obviously want to be clear i'm not comparing myself to what they're going through but i just mean in the broader yeah. Yeah. Of not being in your home and so uh and then my dad sadly died in a motorcycle accident um and then thomas and i finally got my thomas is my husband we finally got the apartment rebuilt we moved back in and then the pandemic arrived <laughs> So, uh, 
oh, happy times. So it kind of kept me from writing for a bit. However, in the end, what it ended up doing in the mornings, I would wake and I would go downstairs or wherever we were in this hotel or spare bedroom or and I would work on this book, Her Last Affair, which I just got the finished copies. I know there's that big one here, but, yeah. um, and it's set at an old drive-in movie theater. And that's the, pe some people are like, is that a billboard? It's actually the old drive-in movie theater screen. And um, I just channeled my, in some ways I channeled my heartbreak into these characters, but I also kind of, it was my escape for me. It was kind of a place to go during an unhappy time. And, and I'm proud of the way it came out, so. Yeah, yeah, because, and what you've got is there's a lot in it, a lot of drama that happens in this book that I think was fueled by what you were going through, like, you know, at the same time, you know, th there's this, so tell us about the last of her last affair. Tell us about what's going on and the catalyst of it as well, because there's something that you saw that sort of drove you to start thinking about this book. Well, it's, um, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, whenever I go home to visit my mom, I pass an old abandoned drive-in movie theater and no one probably notices it. It's off the side of the road. The sign is all overgrown and blocked by trees, but I always notice it. It's the Rocky Point Drive-In. And I just would always stare at it kind of obsessively and wonder those what if questions that writers wonder, like, you know, what if it was owned by this couple? What if the couple ran it for 50 years when it's heyday? And then when it when drive-ins fell out of style, they tried to keep it going. And what if a few nights before their 50th wedding anniversary, the husband dies in a mysterious accident out in the woods behind the drive-in? And I started researching abandoned drive-in movie theaters uh, online. And I found hundreds of images of these just beautiful haunting images. I shared them on my social media and Instagram, which is just at John Searles, my name. And um, I shared the images because they're just drive-ins all across America forgotten by time. And I just thought, what a beautiful, eerie setting for a novel. And then I thought, what if I wrote, tried to write a story about love? And I, I don't write romance novels, so I don't mean like a bodice ripper, but mm -hmm. more like a strange, unusual, dark in places. Not, I wouldn't call it a love story, but a story about love, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I came up with the idea. Um, and that, there's much more I can say to explain it, but that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the genesis of the idea and the, and the setting. And I had so much fun writing it. Yeah. You can tell, you can absolutely tell because they're just moments of, oh, wow, that's like Keon, spot on. So yeah. did you like go to the drive-in when you were a kid? Have you ever been to a drive-in? Yes, well, I mean, we didn't go obsessively, but my parents would did the thing where they'd load up the station wagon and we'd put our pajamas on and go. And again, I we probably went maybe only just a half dozen times. So it wasn't all the time, but I had that experience. And it's just, just such a specific setting. And mm -hmm. then also during the pandemic, they had a resurgence, you know, because people didn't want to be inside in a movie theater. So people started going to drive-ins. And I went, I spoke at um, a book festival up in Albany, um, before, I guess the year before the pandemic and my husband went to Skidmore College up there and there was a drive-in there. We went and I toured the drive-in. I was looking at it, taking notes. And then they invited us back that night to watch a movie. And we went and watched a movie in the stars. And it, I don't know, it's just magical. I just think yeah. it's an interesting setting for a novel. And I'm not aware of, there might be one. Someone tell me if there is, but I'm not aware of a lot of books set in old creepy drive-in, so. No, and, and I like when they put the little speaker thing over your window, like it was just like there, and it's, and then you could go out and go to the concession stand and buy food, but you could, but you'd still be able to see the movie, you wouldn't be able to hear the movie until you got close to the concession stand. It's just this experience that you can't quite like, you know, talk about unless you've been there, you know, it's. I mean, it's just, they're so, it's larger than life up on that screen, these, these actors and all the things they're doing. So I had a lot of fun with that. And then all the sensory details too, with the, the sounds of the projection room and the, like you said, it's that bar and being there and all, and all of that too. And, and another thing, just to kind of set up really the book, it's three seemingly separate storylines uh, that halfway through the book converge in a very surprising way. So you have three different characters and, and the book is not a traditional thriller. I don't really think of myself as a thriller writer, just think of myself as a storyteller. And so um, it starts out more of a character study, really. Mm -hmm. You have Skyla Hull, who owned the drive-in, who's a widow who lost her husband a year before in this freak accident. And in the wake of his death, she finds out some things about his life and she 
through the course of the book tries to reconnect with someone from mm -hmm. his past. And then you have two other characters also grappling with issues of love who are both reconnecting with people from their past. So there are three characters. So there's Skylar who ran the drive-in. Then there's a woman, Linnell, who's about to turn 50. She's in a really boring marriage. And uh, one morning on Facebook, she receives a message from her very first boyfriend who she always kind of carried a little flame for. Uh, and he says, I've been thinking about you all these years. I've never forgotten you. And so she begins an online affair with him. And then you have another, a third character seemingly disconnected as well, uh, a writer in New York City who gets an assignment to go to Providence and review a restaurant. And while he's there, he looks up uh, his first love, the woman who, a woman who broke his heart horribly 25 some years ago. And the two agree to go to dinner. And it's a momentous evening to say the least. Yes, to say uh, the least, to say yeah, the least. <laughs> three different characters all um, reconnecting with the past and some issue around love or a lost love. And then halfway through their storylines converge because they're very seemingly disconnected. And then they converge and the book really twists into much more of a, of a thriller. Yeah, it does. It, it absolutely does. So what character and scenario came to you first? Was it Skywell? Now, who, which one was it that you started? Know, bits and pieces. Really, it was Jeremy who um, I, you know, you always talk about, I always talk about big inspirations like driving by the drive-in, but I used to walk around the, walk my dog around the West Village where we live and I would see this guy walking this very fancy white standard poodle show dog that had you know the fluffy hair and the the snout and like room perfectly and i would just always be fascinated like what he must brush that dog eight thousand a week like you know and so i just started writing a little character um this guy jeremy who agrees to take care of his girlfriend's show dog because he wants to win her back and the dog is just needs to be uh, brushed and do all these things. And and so I kind of started fiddling with that, then Linnell a little bit, but in the back of my mind, I always had the woman who ran the drive-in, but I was almost afraid to write her. So I, she was alive in my mind, but I was writing the kind of other two first. And whenever they would arrive at the drive-in, it would kind of stop because I would look over, there's these two cottages and I would look over in my mind at one of the cottages and think, I know Skyla, who owns the drive in is in there and I've got to write her story. And then my editor one day at lunch, Kate Nitzel, she's fantastic. She said to me, you have to write her. She's your key to everything. And then finally I just worked up the courage and started writing her story. And the first line to her story is, and to the book is every marriage has its secrets. Mm -hmm. And you know, I feel like that that's my way of saying, come on in reader, come let's go. In, <laughs> let's go from there. Let's <laughs> go with what's going on, you know, and oh boy. So Skyla also walks around in nurse attire and she still wears her nurse's uniform and she carries drugs in her pocket that we constantly are hearing about. She can feel the syringe. She can feel the various pills in her pocket. So it's immediately like that Stephen King kind of moment of who is this person? She doesn't have an act. She's got a syringe <laughs> and she's wandering around and is she syringing herself or is something else going to happen? So Tell us, like, you know, really, she, I could see why you held off on her as a character. She'd be terrifying me. <laughs> well, yeah, she, you know, there's something about nurses, obviously they're wonderful, but there's something about this idea of, if you think about it, Annie Wilkes in Misery, if you think about Nurse Ratched and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, there's something about the nurse, scary nurse, like, it's just somehow nurses as wonderful as they are when they're turned instead of helping people to the dark side that can be really scary but what I wanted to do with Skyla was she's strange and unusual and all this but by the end of the book what I'm hoping and I've heard this from some readers when you find out what her life story is and what happened to her and how the whole trajectory of everything you actually have a lot of sympathy for her mm -hmm. which kind of breaks your heart too you know mm -hmm. um, I hope uh, you know that's my goal as a writer is to create empathy for these characters. And even if at first you're just kind of trying to figure out who are these people, um, but by the end, when you see all she's gone through and, and who she was as a young woman, who, what she wanted to be, because she dreamed of being like the most wonderful nurse. She always believed herself to be the most wonderful nurse. And then things didn't work out in her favor.
Yeah, the things just like to go that way. But Skyla is also really funny because there's another character called, character called Siri. And it feels like she's having these conversations with Siri all the time. And it's just really funny because Siri feels like she's a 21st century character that comes up in a lot of works these days. And, you know, she's getting residuals for all the times that she enters into a plot. So was it like, oh, tell Siri what to do. Talk to us about that because it was really funny. Well, I actually... Carol, I've talked to a few different interviews in the last few days, and you're the first person to mention Siri. <laughs> you win an award, thank you. I had, you know, I laughed a lot because Siri in my own life, I'm sure with a lot of people tuning into this, you know, she misunderstands things. If you say things like, you know, I need directions to the gas station and she's like, I don't know, what TV station do you want to watch? It's always off. So um, Skyla in that kind of, um, she's a little cantankerous, almost like in a maybe, I hope in like an Olive Kitteridge kind of way, like a little tough and, you know, quirky. She, when Siri misunderstands things, Skyla just loses her temper, <laughs> like starts insulting Siri. And then, you know, there are all these fun things you can do that with, <laughs> with Siri where you can get her to talk back and say funny things. And so I just had a lot of fun researching that and writing it. And I think my editor, we sort of agreed, we pulled some of it back because, oh, I could have, I could have done oh chapters all to Siri, but but we just enough where I hope people get a kick out of it. So I'm so thrilled that you did. Well, I was realizing there was one night we were going to a drive-in theater and my friend goes, I'll just have Siri tell us where we are, right? And she's talking to Siri and we're getting more and more lost. Like we're looping around and she goes, Siri, I'm going to kill you. I can't believe this. And Siri says, the number for the nationwide suicide hotline is, and we're just sitting there like, so what we want to do is get to this movie theater. And Siri is going, now, if you feel suicidal, she's going on and on and on. So when I was reading the book, all I was thinking is all these moments of Siri, like being a little bit off. So the character's a little bit off, but so is Siri. Like the two of them together are quite a match, quite a match. <laughs> but it's funny. But they, but but Skyla needs Siri to help her as we all do. So it's kind of a funny relationship. I'm, I'm really happy, Carol, that you read at a level that you noticed that detail. So thank you, because I, yes, I, I just, I'm writing and I think, oh, this is funny to me, Bob. Will anyone else appreciate it? So I'm so happy that you did, because I wanted the book to feel a little funny too, you know, and in, in, in places like with the show dog and all the stuff happening or Siri. So I, I'm always so happy when people write me and say like, I found it scary, I found it sad, I found it poignant, and I also found it kind of really funny in place. And that's the ultimate compliment to, for me, so, so thank you. Well, it's like Pretty the Dog, and he takes Pretty the Dog into this former girlfriend's house, and she has a dog as well that's like, you know, like practically a pit bull, like it's a huge thing. And all he's thinking is, Pretty is gonna be devoured by like when they leave the house. So that dog's gotta go. And it's just symbolic that that dog gets thrown back in this bedroom and the door gets closed. And then he is like the show dog is like, it's the prance around the house. And it says something to me about what happens later on. It says something to me about the setup of what late, like later on of like, we've got good and evil going back and forth. And reader, thank you. We follow me around and say these things all the time. <laughs> notice that I think about that people people don't always read at that level, which is fine, but it, it's wonderful to hear because I, first of all, her name is pretty, you yes. know, and, and I think Marianne, who owns the other dog, says, oh, why don't you bring pretty over? I just got a puppy. They'll love to play together. And then she's like, let me get the puppy. And then she goes in the back of the apartment and out comes this like beast of a dog. <laughs> running over and, and Jeremy's like, what kind of dog is that? She's like, I don't really know. Part Rottweiler, part Pitbull. <laughs> so I just had fun with that. So thank you for knowing. And it's like, you just see it. Like you just see this thing comes out and he's like, oh my gosh, I've got the show dog. Like, it's gonna be like, it's gonna have fur wrapped around him by the time he comes back as we wipe fur all over this dog. And they have to separate them and he's not happy, but it's just these, there are sad moments and there's scary moments, but then there's amazingly really funny moments. I mean, I just really love it. Which character was your favorite to write? Which one was? It's funny because people, someone else asked me this recently, and I guess I would say Skyla, but really I had so much fun with them all. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's interesting because so much now is made about like, right, I'm a guy, a gay man, and I've written in many books from a, a woman's point of view, but I, they asked me that once I did a Today Show segment and they said, um, I was talking about my previous book, Helpful the Haunted, and the host asked me on the Today Show, you know, about 
how do you feel as a guy writing from a, a young girl's point of view, a young teenage girl's point of view? And I, I just made a joke. I said, isn't it obvious deep down I am a teenage girl? And my mother said, that's when she turned off the television. <laughs> Mm -hmm. My mother said, I turned off the TV. She said, I'll watch it later. I, I had to stop. But, um, you know, I grew up in a house with, my dad was a truck driver. He was always on the road. I, my dad, older brother was off all the time. And so I was really with my two sisters and my mom all the time. And then in school, being a gay kid, like other boys knew I was gay before I knew. And they would bullied me and tortured me. And so really my friends were the girls. And... Then when I got out of college, I ended up working at a woman's magazine at Cosmo with an office full of really brilliant, smart, funny, great women, many of whom you know, Carol. Right. And um, so I would say, I feel, must feel more comfortable writing from a woman's point of view than a man's. <laughs> <laughs> really, I don't want to say that blithely because the truth is I work with my editor, Kate, who's a woman and a smart woman. And I have my first round of readers are all women. So I make, I take it. I joke about that just to be kind of funny about it, but I also take it very seriously. And I want it to, um, I want anyone coming to the book to feel like it feels real to them. And so I spent a tremendous amount of time trying to get the voices right. And I think I had a lot of fun with Skyla because she's so colorful and eccentric and strange. And then has these moments where she has a real heart. And, you know, she said something because when she was a nurse and worked the night shift, she would read these romance novels all the time as an escape. And in my years of Cosmo being a books editor, I read so many romance novels. And the Linnell character asked her like, well, what makes a perfect love story to you, romance? And she says, well, the couple needs a unique how we met story. And then there's a lot of obstacles that makes it seem like they're never gonna be together. And at the very last minute in an unexpected twist, there's a happy ending. And I wanted it to be like that with this book when I was writing Skyla and Linnell and Jeremy, like as dark and crazy as strange as things get at the very last minute, I wanted there to be a twist that leaves the reader with a moment of sweetness. And I hope I do that. I don't know. Right. You know. After, well, after looking at big freezers and things like that, it's, you know, it's an interesting way to end up. Definitely. It's definitely, you know, there's, you talk about Cosmo, there's a column in the book that's called The Ugly Truth. And yeah. reminded me of a column that could have appeared in Cosmo, like, you know, because it was always at the magazine, it was always, um, you had column writers, like people would come in and write a column on dating or a column, we get a guy in to write from his point of view or stuff like that. Were you channeling that with the ugly truth? <laughs> I think I was a little bit because we used to, you know, at the time doing Cosmo, you know, and Cosmo was so it's always kind of looked at at the time of the crazy outlandish cover lines which were hilarious and funny, but there were also a lot of really great articles that weren't on the cover, but there were financial advice and health advice and you know, all this sort of stuff. But, they, um, but there were those things where it was like men just kind of saying whatever they, you know, giving their own version of how it is for a man. And then we'd have women write how it is for women. And that was always the discussion, what this discussion between the sexes at the time. And so I was channeling some of that in that, that column called the ugly truth <laughs> the ugly truth i was like so oh god i so know what you're talking about here you know the ugly truth the ugly truth you know at one point i mean there's a long section for marianne that i actually want to read and this is really interesting it's who wants the world to think they've failed who wants anyone to think their life is not perfect that they're not happy and successful and fulfilled every day who wants anyone to know the truth that the, th the things that they wanted the most in life they're either messed up on their own or they just plain got screwed out for no good reason. I feel like this is so true these days, especially with social media. Everything's got to be perfect. Yeah. Everything's got to be, this is the way it is. It's manufactured. Um, I fear for little children because they've been in these manufactured little lives where no one cries, like no one ever is upset. Everything's always in this glorified little world. And I think it's hard for little children when they look back on how they were portrayed and then also it's going to be teens and the pressure on teens, 20 somethings, whatever, and the pressure on older people as well. So I think that line was just so good because she sets up one thing when he comes to meet her, when Jeremy comes there, and then he finds out it's all a facade and it's they a both of life. Versions of their lives to each other because they haven't seen each other in 25 years. So the versions they present are not true. And then at the end of the night, one by one they get dismantled and it was 
personally, it was kind of thrilling to write all that because I kind of, it was one of those times, sometimes writing, you're writing really from your head and you're kind of plotting. That was something that just kind of really came out of me. Like I, mm-hmm. I had this vision for like, these people come together, they haven't seen each other in years. She overheard, he overheard her say something years before that so it broke his heart so horribly that he stayed away for 25 some years and now he's back and trying to not think about that thing he heard her say. And so, um, yeah, I just had, a great time writing it and I think what she says is true and so much of the book is about that the effect of social media or or falling in love with a person or the idealized version of the person what you think they are in their mind versus who they really are you know so by the way someone asked me well because there's so much that part of the book where Jeremy had overheard his first love say something so heartbreaking that he didn't talk to her for 25 years. And they said, did you ever overhear anyone say anything about you? And I actually have two stories. Do you want me to tell you? Yes, tell me, tell me. Thomas and I had this couple for dinner on a snowy February night. And so uh, at the end of the evening, they left and one forgot their sweater. And so I was like, oh, they're in the elevator. I'll run it down the stairwell. So I grabbed the sweater, run down the stairwell. And just as I'm about to enter the lobby, Carol, I hear them step out the elevator and they say, ugh, they serve such heavy food. And John eats so fast. <laughs> So I froze and came back upstairs with the sweater. And Thomas said, why didn't you give them a sweater? I said, they were talking about us. They didn't even wait to the sidewalk. But also it was a snowy night. We made like lamb or something. I don't know. Like we serve it. You serve heavy fo- food during a snowstorm. Um, and the other one is I did this wonderful outreach to book clubs last time around with Help for the Haunted. It was 50, yes, 50 book clubs in 50 yeah. states. Yes, I remember that came from a Cosmo, we used to do 50 batches, 50 states. And so Thomas actually had the idea, you should do 50 book clubs, 50 states. HarperCollins helped organize it, it was wonderful. And oh, everyone kept saying, are all the book clubs nice? And I kept saying, yes, they're all wonderful. They're so nice. Like people would have me in their homes and make these elaborate dinners based on the book. I, I felt so, I always feel lucky to be a writer and after being a waiter for 12 years and you know putting myself <laughs> in college and graduate school, I feel so lucky to do what I do. But I felt really lucky doing 50 book clubs to these states. I said, everyone's been really nice. And then it happened. There was one state, I don't want to say, but it rhymes with Shmorja. <laughs> <laughs> and I love you if you're watching from Shmorja. But these five ladies were, I Skyped with them and they were in um, the back of a library. There were a lot of boxes around and they were kind of like, and I, I kind of joked like, looks like a hostage trade off. <laughs> 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 they didn't laugh and you know, I. I, they just seemed not into me or whatever. And I, so I, but I talked and I kind of read the book and they just were kind of staring. I said, okay, well, you know, thank you so much and, you know, enjoy your day, whatever. And then we hung up or so we thought we hung up. They, they didn't hang up. And I heard Thomas said, I said, please tell Thomas, said, please tell me you hung up. I said, no, I took notes. They said, Maxine, do you think he's gay? <laughs> he seems gay. He seems really, really gay. <laughs> And then one said, well, I might actually read the book now. And the other one said, I don't think I will. <laughs> I, I, here's the thing. I am both sensitive, but I also have kind of a thick skin. And I found it hilarious. Like, <laughs> I, I was like, for whatever reason, th- whatever. But then the next day, the librarian wrote me to thank me. And Thomas again said, please tell me you just said you're welcome. And I said, no, I felt like I should tell them. Because if, God forbid, there's some really sensitive writer sitting at home and that happens to that writer they might be devastated and so I felt like I needed to protect other writers so I said I said wrote and said thank you so much it was such a pleasure I'm always happy to meet new readers I'm so grateful just so you know in the future make sure you hang up your Skype because it was still on and you can tell Maxine I am gay I don't know what that has to do with anything but let her know and I said um but really I just you know I thought it was funny and I'm so appreciative, but just another writer might be more sensitive than me. So just be careful in the future. And she never responded. She never responded. <laughs> well, anyway. There's those- 49 bookstores in 50 states going forward. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Adriana Shajani told me one time that she would, did an event and they were outside or they were inside and they decided to go out by the pool and they didn't take her with them. <laughs> so she's like, hello, 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 hello. And you're like, come back, come back. 
She also told a funny story that she used to do it while she did laundry, like folding laundry. She'd do book clubs. And one time the laundromat, the one, the washer went into the agitation stage oh, as she was talking. And it sounded like she was being attacked. Like, dun, 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 Sorry. Yeah, I like the other night I watched you on Wine with Wade. And I love the fact that you had those little stories from when you were little with the drawings and everything. And then you said your parents at that point still didn't know you were gay. Like they still didn't figure it out. I used to make, my mom had a book of wallpaper swatches and I used to tear out the wallpaper swatches, glue them with cardboard, bind with duct tape, fill them with paper and write stories. And they were called, the names I was looking when I was on with Wade were like over the rainbow, behind the rainbow, in sugar plum land. And I'm like, <laughs> How did my parents not pick up on these cues? <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, but I wish I had it. We're back in the city now, but yeah, it was. Um, I, I would show it to you, but it it is a sweet book. You know, I always wanted to be a writer, right. and yeah. I didn't know how. Like, no one in my family had gone to college. My dad was a truck driver. My parents used to send me trucking in the summers with him to quote make a man out of me. I always say, I don't think they got the results they wanted, but. On those trips, my dad used to buy me the mass market paperbacks at the truck stop. So like I read The Shining, I read John Irving's books. I, and I was young reading these books, and, but it was so boring kind of being on the road. And um, my mom used to have a Sidney Sheldon collection. She loved all his books. And I would, going on those trips, I would take them like If, if Tomorrow Comes or The Other Side of Midnight, and I would read those. But I would be like 12 years old reading Sidney Sheldon. So I. <laughs> kind of joke sometimes I think my books are a mix of those influences when I was mm -hmm. working on my dad like the spookiness of Stephen King the drama of Sidney Sheldon the quirkiness of John Irving I don't know right. so maybe there was a mix of what I read when I was little on those trucking trips I don't know yeah and this book definitely has all three there's these really funny moments maybe it'd be a great movie anybody listening out there great movie because you could just see the way the whole thing and it's not a series it's a movie <laughs> this is just like one day one snapshot of these people yeah. You know, we, we both have these really long careers in magazines. Yours was even longer than mine. And, you know, I saw that things were going to go through a shift, actually. This is really weird. In 1995, I stopped by mag one of the departments one day, and they were launching Epicurious. And I looked at this, and I was like, whoa, this is going to be this really cool thing. Like, I was just standing, like, looking at the screen that was black and white with no pictures, because you couldn't put three pictures in. And I just said, this is going to be a really interesting way for people to communicate. Like I saw it like, you know, right back then. And then once it started to build, people in print were fighting it. Like this is not, I remember Cy Newhouse goes, this is not going to be a thing. And at the same time, there was this whole other internet thing happening at the same time. And it was, who's going to command it? Is, remember Kate White, is it going to be the editor in chief doing both? What's going to end up happening? So did you feel that same, like you, you had that push and pull over a Cosmo of like, where does the books article go? Where does this go? Where does it belong? So let's talk about that because I always felt like when I was at the magazine, I always felt like the magazine should have the article and the sidebar should be on the internet at the beginning to get people to do both. But it never became that. So you talk about it because you did a lot longer than I did. Uh, you know, I always held on to my books editor position because I loved books and I sort of, that became almost like a side gig while I was there. But for a long while, I was the brand director of Cosmo. So Kate and I, wonderful Kate White, the editor-in-chief. We worked together for I think, 14 years together and I'd also been there previously under Helen when I started in the books department. And uh, we we thought the the one strength that Cosmo, not the one strength, but the main strength Cosmo had was trust from its readers. It's the number one monthly magazine in the world for women and readers trusted Cosmo. And we thought if we started farming that out to other people, um, other departments, other things, you know, it just might lose that trust factor and that unified voice. And in my humble opinion, that is exactly what happened. And you know, mm -hmm. the magazine, you know, it's still a wonderful magazine, but it's not what it had been. And no. so we watched it happen with all magazines. And Kate, we, she would talk about it coming. So I, we saw it coming and we knew, and I, you know, I feel grateful I was there for 20 plus years and had such a great time. I met so many smart, wonderful women and, and men too. And I just enjoyed it. You know, like I said, I grew up trucking with my dad and waiting tables. And so when I got that, that gig in the books department, just as opening packages is how I started. And I worked my way up. 
it was like falling in a rabbit hole. It was like a whole other world I didn't know. And like people would just send you things, like send you books. I loved books. I lived in the library growing up. Like people are just sending me books like to read. I was like, so thrilled. So yeah, it was a great experience, but it definitely was a seismic shift and transition. Yeah, a seismic shift and transition of the way people were getting information. Okay, first of all, Cosmo used to come once a month. I was at Mademoiselle, it came once a month. Now things are coming at you every day. You could go read and you'd never sit down and just read the magazine. You'd read bits and parts. And I think that it's sort of like music. Music was constructed, like I'll use Paul Simon, this is my favorite. Paul Simon would construct how you were gonna listen to the album. What song yeah. was first, second, third. And now you listen to pieces and you don't listen the same way. You can roll it whatever way you want. You can pull whatever songs you're interested in. It's a, just a completely different experience. Yeah. And I felt like with magazines, it was set up. There's the the um, front of book stories. There's the well. There's the this. There's that. And it's all very, very thought through. And now it became, you're the editor. You're just reading whatever you want. And you're kind of missing that bigger picture. And I was thinking about it in terms of the book as well. It's almost like if you had just two of these characters. Okay, let's say somebody was going to read this book and they weren't going to read it as a book. They were going to just come in on the chapters with Jeremy and Maureen. They were just going to come in on the chapters with this. And they were going to push it in all their own little directions on what to do. It wouldn't be the same thing. You know, and it's the thing you can't pull it apart. That's a really good point because you need the other bits to kind of flavor the whole thing. You're right. Yeah. And if you skip a chapter or you skip this or you skip that, you don't have the same vibe. And mm -hmm. what I feel like is with a lot of media right now, not just magazines, just everything, it really is what is that thing right now? Or is it just the parts and bits that you know that you get in your email in the morning or this like, you know, point of view from, and I read a lot. I read a lot of read morning brew first thing in the morning. I switch over, I read the skim just because I like all different points of view. I'll reach over, read the Wall Street Journal, read the New York Times. I'll read Katie Couric. I'll read it all to see what they thought was most important to share with you that day. And yes. just to see what the take is on it. Yeah, you're right though. Everything is much more fractured now. It doesn't have that kind of, here we are presenting you with a whole thing for you to consume. You're right. It is it is more fractured. With, with a beat. And it was with a beat. It was, this is what we're going to do. We're going to draw you in. We're going to pull this. Even the spreads of fashion, even the spreads of whatever. Is it four pages or it's six or is it eight? What are we going to do is telling the story? What do we really need? Do we need two pages of this? Do we need? And it's all different now because it's just this mishmash of, you figuring it all out. And when I think about it, if I was a kid, if I was 14, it's like you have to figure out all media for yourself right now. It's you have to figure it all out. Whereas before you'd be able to read something, you'd often, I had courses in college where we, we, we looked at the New York Times, I had courses here, there, the other place where you'd look at a magazine, take it apart and look at it. Not the same thing anymore. And I don't uh, mean to sound old. I just mean to say, this is the difference. And when you look at a book like yours right now, you see you were seeing all the different parts, but how they had to go. You know, one thing I did, Carol, that I, because I realized with the book that it's three seemingly separate storylines that converge. But while I was writing it, I thought, I probably need to signal to the reader that this is all part of one thing. And so that's how I came up with the idea of the movie quotes that open each chapter. Yes. Because I thought yes. that's a message to the reader. This is all part of one thing. And so the way it works is, um, each chapter opens with a quote from a film that once played on the screen, there it is, at the drive-in. And uh, whether it's like a classic like Casablanca or like more sinister fair like Psycho or The Shining or like forgotten 80s fluff like Mannequin or Overboard or Cannonball Run, the quotes act as clues to what's about to happen or the mystery of the book. And so they do that, it creates a fun puzzle for the for the reader, but also to your point of things seeming fractured, I wanted it to feel like, even though they seem separate at first, this is all part of one thing. So to create a sense of unity, so. Mm -hmm. And you go back and what I encourage readers to do is the quote is the setup and you're looking and quotes are sometimes like the epigraphs at the beginning of a book or the prologue, which you really should go back and read at the end because the prologue was signaling something, but go back and look at the end if it's got a, pro a book's got a prologue. But if not, go in and look at the epigraphs at the end, go in and look at these titles at the end because then they're gonna make a lot more sense to you. Then it's <laughs> gonna be like, got it, you know? Or you're in on the joke, you know what I mean? So so you did books for years. So all this reading for years and then you, when, how, many, how many years ago did you start writing? I don't remember now. I mean, I wrote, you know, I, I 
wrote all the time growing up, but I didn't know how to be a writer. And then in college, I was majoring in business because I thought it was practical, but minoring in creative writing because I loved it. And then my sister, sadly, my younger sister, mm -hmm. two, but one of them passed away after her senior prom, very tragically. And in the aftermath of that, I sounds cliche to say, and writers aren't supposed to use cliches, but I just realized life is short. And I thought, I always want to be a writer. I saw how fragile life is. And I thought, I'm gonna figure out how to do it. And my dad at the time was shipping, I applied to NYU and, was on a, and I got in, I got a partial scholarship. My dad was shipping Broadway show sets around the country for tours. He worked for this company called Ugly Air Trucking. And he was coming into the city and he was bringing the set of Kiss the Spider Woman, which was a giant bird cage. <laughs> actually, and some other things into the city. And so I packed my stuff in garbage bags and my dad, I came into the city with my dad in his tractor trailer. And I started school and I started writing, but it didn't happen right away. I waited tables a total of 12 years through mm -hmm. the college, put myself to graduate school and all when I was trying to be a writer. And I often tell the story that like, I when I was trying to become a writer and I wrote a first book, um, I met a friend of a friend of a friend who worked at a publishing house and she said you don't need an agent she was an editor she said just send me the book i was so excited i off you know put in a package send it to her and a few months later the manuscript came back uh with a very polite letter saying thank you i didn't connect as much as i hope best of luck and i thought okay it hurt but, but then i took the manuscript out of the box and this little scrap of paper fluttered to the floor and it said and i quote i could barely make it to page 60. And I feel really sorry for anyone who has to read the whole thing. It was an in-house reader who mistakenly left the note in the back. It was not meant for my eyes. So yeah, uh, I like took to my bed, very dramatic. It's like, I'll never write again. And I really thought I would. And I was like, it's too heartbreaking. I've spent year 12 of waiting tables. And I loved waiting tables. It was so social, I made good money, but I was just, it's not what I wanted to do. And so, but then one day I was cleaning under my bed and I weirdly writing and cleaning are very connected to me. And I heard the first sentence to a new story, which was whenever my father disappeared, we looked for him on Hanover street. And I wrote it down And that really that story that's based on my childhood because my mom and I spent a lot of my childhood, we'd drive around and she would send me into the bars to get my father and Hanover street in Bridgeport was where one of his girlfriends lived. So we would go look for him there. So I wrote, anyway, I wrote the sentence down and then I just kept writing as the sentences came. And I thought, I'm not even gonna try to get published. I'm just gonna write because I, I love to write. I always yeah. do. And then that book sold and that became my first book. And then I've written Boys Still Missing, Strange But True, Help for the Haunted, and now Her Last Affair, which I'm proud of. So uh, I don't think I could, I don't think I could stop, Carol. It's just what I do. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So. And you've got a number of articles coming out in the next couple of weeks and months. Like, and I like that too, because it's your, your chance to do a story and you write great stories. So, well, I have a piece tomorrow coming out in the New York times. Uh, well, it appears online tomorrow and I'm not sure then when it appears in the paper, but I'll, it appears online tomorrow and it's called, they might change the title, but sometimes they do that, but I don't think they are. It's called Confessions of a Wedding Hater. And what it's about, the first line says, if you're reading this and I attended your wedding, I'd like to apologize for my behavior. <laughs> so because all my life, I'm sorry if you're watching this, I hated weddings. Like I would get the invitation and I'm just like, oh God, I don't want to go. And then, but then during the pandemic on the 25th anniversary of meeting Thomas, my husband, we got married and <laughs> I am now a convert, Carol. Anyone watching this, if you're getting married and you're having a wedding, send me an invitation. I'd love to come. I And so the piece is very tongue in cheek and funny about like crazy wedding stories and me avoiding wanting to get married with Thomas and like how finally when I agreed, I'm like, okay, we'll just do it at town hall. We went to town hall and like, it was like men filling out their hunting and fishing applications. <laughs> and like, this is too impersonal even for me. And the woman behind the counter saw that look of horror on my face. <laughs> she wrote down this number. She slid it across the desk and said, call the town justice. She'll come to your house and do it. <laughs> and so she did come to my house, our, our house, when we got married on our back patio with just Thomas's parents and just at the last minute, a few friends who were like, we are overriding your ridiculousness, John, because I just didn't want people to fuss over me. They're like, we're coming. And they came and it was really special. And I, in the piece explores why I had kind of a, a wall up about weddings and marriage and all that. But now I'm on the other side of it. And really the last line says, if you're getting married, invite me 
the more curly Q font on your invitation, the better. Like I'll be there. I'd be honored to attend because um, so that comes out tomorrow on the New York Times and um, and then I have this exciting launch event on Tuesday. Um, uh, does this run before Tuesday? I don't know if I should talk about it. Or it's should Tuesday. I... We're just going to run on Tuesday. So yeah, it's fine. It's fine now. So it's in uh, New York City. It's New York City Symphony Space, and it's with the Academy Award nominated actress Amy Ryan. And people know her from The Office, The Wire, the film Gone Baby Gone, and so many other other movies. And also, um, most recently, with Steve Martin and Martin Short in Only Murders in the Building. Hulu. She's wonderful. She starred in the film adaptation of my novel, Strange But True, which is on HBO Max now. And uh, we met on set and became friends and have stayed friends. And I asked her, do you want to do this launch event for my new book? And she said, yes. So it's um, in partnership with 40 bookstores around the country. And so anyway, wow. if you want to come via live stream, I'd love to have you there. And I share the list of books and Carol, I can send it to you. I don't know how you promote things but the list of stores and if you order a copy of her last affair from one of the stores and they're all over the country they're great indie bookstores that need our support uh they'll give you an access code to live stream the event as it happens in new york city before a live audience so we're really excited and to do it amy is absolutely wonderful and you know it's just going to be a great night because we're doing all this stuff because of the drive and we made all this great drive and movie footage for when people come in we're giving out movie popcorn and um it's just we have a whole drive-in theme for the night and so it's going to be wonderful and amy actually i love to chat as you could tell but i don't consider myself the best reader and so she said let me read i'll read something for the book i said really she said well normally people want to hear the writer read but it's in my <laughs> house i can do this so she was so nice she offered and so she's going to read the opening of the book with mm. Skyla and you know the whole setup of everything and i i could not be more honored to have such a great actress and a friend to to share the night with me and also so many bookstores and so many readers and things so i'm really excited about it i hope people will come yeah, uh, it, it sounds like an exciting evening. And it's also, it's like this buildup of exactly the way you are. You're like, it's just like, oh, let me put this evening together. Oh, this is, let's look at the publisher, 40 bookstores. It'll be really great. We'll link to the article from the Times as well. We'll find the article from the Times. We'll put it in the notes down below with the podcast notes and whatever. So do you love about, do you love noir? Because this is really a feeling. There's a feeling in this book of noir. There's so many different feelings in this book. Do, do you love it? And do you have a favorite noir film? Well, I love Double Indemnity, you know, and that's just probably the best noir film of all time. And I just watched it again recently. Um, I do love noir and I just love great stories. And I think all good stories have a mystery to them. And as I said before, everything gets so categorized and I understand publishers have to do that for marketing reasons. I get it and I'm grateful for it, but I don't always think of myself as a technically whatever it is to be a quote thriller writer, because really, I'm just trying to write a really captivating, compelling, unique story. And I hope that's what I've done. And I, I said to you earlier, Carol, someone I did a conversation with the other day said, you know what it reminded me of? A Coen Brothers film like Fargo. And I was so complimented. He said, because it's funny and dark and sad. And I just was so, it was the ultimate compliment for me mm -hmm. because um, I just try to make it I don't know, I just write what's in my heart. I put a lot of my own self into it. And, uh, you know, life has all these different tones, like all these different notes, like life is funny moments and sad moments and dark moments and happy moments. And so I have try to put that feeling in my book. So yeah. it's life with lots of different moments. So I hope, I hope people like it. We'll see. Fargo is a good comp. Fargo is a very, very good comp. Very, very good comp. So what's your writing process like? Do you outline with this messy first draft? Do you do these meticulous notes up front? Like, well, this is when I, when I first met Thomas years ago, we, we were kids and I would get up from like two to four. He'd be asleep and I would write in the middle of the night. And then he would say, when do you write these books? Like, I never see you actually write. <laughs> now we're a little older. I'm like, come quick. I wrote a sentence. <laughs> Come on, I actually wrote a paragraph. <laughs> it's, it's like, it doesn't come as easy all the time because um, I don't Look know. Look at my sentence. Is it good? Is it a yeah. good sentence? Should I keep going? <laughs> exactly. But um, really, I, I usually, it changes all the time, but it seems to be a common theme. Mornings are better. Yellow legal pads. I love a fresh yellow legal pad. I love pencil. And I, then I can be a little more free. And then I transfer it to the computer and I and I do a lot of reading out loud because I kind of hear it. And then I love to write in the bathtub. You know, when I grew up, I grew up 
in a little two bedroom house with my grandfather, my parents, four of us kids, dogs, cats, fish, birds. There were what there was one bathroom, two bedrooms. It was the, a tiny little house. It was so much love and craziness, but uh, I my place to escape was to go into the bathtub. I would do my homework in the bathtub. I, <laughs> so I just to me the bathtub was the ultimate comfort place. So I. I have a very dangerous habit, which is I bring my laptop sometimes in the bathtub and Thomas is like, oh God, but I'm sorry, just do, please someone watching invent a waterproof laptop. For just me. your phone. You could just do your phone, do little chapters on your phone and then just, I wrote a sentence, come in. <laughs> Thomas says, it's like, you're really tempting fate. I know I am, I probably will regret it, but um, oftentimes it's legal pads, sometimes my laptop. And then, you know, I'm very lucky. I have a great editor. I have wonderful readers who I trust to read. And, and I spend a long time working on these books. So yeah. um, I, I hope it shows. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. It's for the fourth book. Has your process changed along the way? Has anything changed? Well, my apartment. Yeah, <laughs> well, the apartment. <laughs> did you get to pick how to redecorate it? <laughs> um, yeah, we did kind of redo some things. Um, but anyway, I... um. Has it changed? You know, weirdly, I kind of feel like in some ways I had more confidence when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know why. Like, I, I have more self doubt now. Like, you think it would be the opposite, but I'm, I, you know, I guess I see people can, you put these things out into the world, and sometimes it's like you look at your reviews from readers, and so many are wonderful. I'm grateful for them. And other people are like, uh, Amazon was delayed delivering this pack, was, was delayed delivering this package, one star. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> Give me my book one star because Amazon was late. But so I know people can be critical. And so it makes me a little apprehensive sometimes because I'm, you know, I put my heart into these things I'm putting out in the world. And then I have to remember, I just do it because I love it. And and many, many people thankfully love what I do. And then there are people who don't love it. And, but it makes me sometimes a little shy about it. That's well, all. Some people like heavy food and some people think people eat too fast. I mean, like, really, like seriously. <laughs> They didn't realize that you, you're ready for them to go home. They didn't get that. You know what I mean? Well, listen, oh my God. Carol, listen, you wait tables for 12 years. You learn to eat fast because you're yeah. in the back. You're like, here's some food. You're like, oh. you're like yeah. Yeah. I'm always eating lunch at my desk. So yesterday I said, I've got to get something. I'm going to pass out. So I ran downstairs and I like threw farro and radishes and well, what should we call it? Um, uh, pistachios in a bowl and came back the stairs. I said, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> it was like, Two minutes. It's like I have these two minute meals. I could go back these. There's no time. There's no time. There's no time. But I yeah. guess when you have friends over for dinner, they do expect you to eat a little slower. So lesson learned. Maybe it was true. Maybe I am a fast eater. <laughs> now we sit there. I'll be out with him. Go. <laughs> so was the was the title always her last affair? Was that always the title? It actually was, and I debated with my editor, my agent, because. There are a lot of her titles. There are a lot of last titles. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it was always the title of the book. And so in the end, we decided to keep it. There were some others that I kept throwing out because I worried, like I worry about everything. <laughs> but in the end, it, I think it works because it sounds like an old movie that would have played at the drive-in. Yeah. And it really is Skyla's love story, which is so strange. And, you know, and also Linnell with her affair. And so it kind of, it, it works. Speaking of reviews, one person complained, I didn't like this book. Someone in it is having an affair. I'm like, <laughs> well, the title is their last affair. But again, but Thomas, my editor always says to me, you always call out the few bad reviews. Like you never mention all the good ones. So yeah. I should say there are many great ones. No, they're this. great ones. They're great ones. But it's just really funny when people sit there and say something that's so obvious and you're just there like, what part were you missing? But wait, let's, let's just read. Before that other person, we've got Laura Dave saying it's tense and terrifying. And we've got, Chris Bajillian saying he brings the misfits among us to life with the clarity of Carson McCullers and scares us with the brilliance of Stephen King. So there you go, person yeah, with yeah. one star for being delivered late. There you go. So, and the cover is just amazing. I mean, how did they found the two houses next to the movie theater? It's no, I love the cover so much. It's so I think it's my favorite hardcover ever. It's I just find it really beautiful. And I love those quotes and and I feel honored because and Chris Bojang and I feel like, okay, that actually sets it up because it's about the character and then about the, the scary stuff too. So yeah. he hits both notes. And so I'm I'm grateful to him and to everybody. So thank you. And I love when we find out why the two houses, it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, a heartbreaker. You know, it's really a heartbreaker in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, and then the audio book, did you select Jane Oppenheimer to do the audio? And I like that you read your books aloud because a lot of times 
you catch why am I saying that word again? I shouldn't say that again. And uh, yes, I did. They sent me like three or four choices of narrators and and I didn't know there was something about her voice. I just thought it lent itself to Skyla in particular. And then also then Linnell, she shifts it and you know, she just can, she just tells the story. I've only heard a little bit. They sent me some samples. So I haven't heard that much of it, but what I've heard of what she's done, she's a very talented audiobook act actor is that what we call them an yeah, audio actor, actor. Yeah. performer and, actor you know something like that yeah, yeah. performer whatever the appropriate word is no one get mad at me if i said it wrong um but she brings it to life and what i've heard i think is phenomenal so i feel like we made a good choice with her do you listen to audiobooks is that something you regularly do i don't a lot you know yeah. Can I tell, I don't know if we have to go back. Can I tell a funny story? Sure, 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 sure. Years ago, I was, this is just a funny story. Um, years ago on the Today Show, you know, for years I did book segments on the Today Show and we do them on the plaza. Um, and it was when like I, pods or whatever were first coming out and you could download an audiobook. So we did a segment where it's like, and these great classics you can now listen to. And there was, so we had the book like Great Expectations and some other great classic, all these books, and then showed a little, iPod, whatever it was called at the time, you could download it. And then after the segments, I'd always hand out the books to people on the plaza, you know, the audience that comes okay. to watch the show. And they'd get so excited to get the books. And I loved ha handing them out. And so after the segment, um, I'm handing out the books and people get a little, like they want those books, like, please, but I'm grabbing it from your hands. And so I had great expectations. And this guy was like, please, can you give it to me? Please, please. And I was like, okay, here you go. And he's like, will you autograph it? And I'm like, <laughs> It's great expectations. <laughs> he's like, I don't care. And I, he said, just sign it, please. I'm like, as Charles Dickens or John Searle, because I don't care, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I wrote, best of luck, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't know what to write for Charles Dickens. He was, uh, and he actually laughed, we had a good laugh. But he was so excited to get the book, but I'm like, it's great expectations. There are other copies, but it was such a... <laughs> moment I think you know we just had a good laugh about the whole thing but but it, it used to be funny because if I would do live events for the magazine and like you could win this and everybody's hand is up and I'm like you don't even know what it is like you don't even know what I'm giving away but that idea of well, winning I like stuff too I want to win I want free stuff I like it so I can... yeah I, I've got to win I've got to enter to win or you put this discount code in and you get this knitting pattern for free and I'm like I have to have it. Like, I just have to have that knitting pattern. Yeah. It's like, it becomes this really big deal. I think it's in all of us. We all, if something's like a prize, we're like, I want the prize, whatever it is. Yeah. The prize, the prize. So what's next for you? What are you going to do next? What do you, besides writing great articles, what else is next? Well, I keep joking after my publication's over, I'm just going to drink a lot of wine and sit in a pretty place. I don't know where that is, but um, really I've started a new book and I would like it to be not such a long break between and the mm. book plays on a dark classic that we all sort of know, but it has a kind of a, a twist that brings it into current modern times. And so, so far I'm having fun with it. And let's hope, please, let's hope nothing burns down. Let's well, <laughs> here's, here's a really big question. The person who had the apartment burned down, are they allowed to come back? Are they back? They sublet the apartment. <laughs> so they, because technically that person is a, a victim too, because that person didn't start the fire. Someone right. else started on them. So it's just a complicated situation. And a lot of, a lot of it is what I hear on the floor because I wasn't even here the night of the, of the fire. But Well, you just want to sit there and say, dating, can I meet her? <laughs> I know. Can I meet her? <laughs> Can I approve of your next person? Yeah. Listen, everybody has bad stuff happen in life. What's that, that quote? Like into every life, a little rain must fall. It's like mm -hmm. my, my rain came a lot at once. Um, but, but I'm, I'm grateful, you know, for it and grateful Carol to, to you for having me on grateful for readers who are embracing this book from me. And um, I just feel really fortunate to be able to, I mean, when I was a waiter for 12 years or a paper boy or, you know, I to dream of being a writer and being able to put a book out in the world or walk in a bookstore and seeing your book on a shelf, that, that does not get old to me. And I never, mm -mm. Be, I don't take that for granted. I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. No, you just take it for granted. And you're also so generous with readers because you really do fun interviews. This is people, this is just like we were dishing on the street. This is exactly the way the two of us would be. And we'd be telling the stories, the same kind of thing of like what happened with the book club or whatever. We would do it in like two minutes before we were late for a lunch or late to get back to the office. So 
John, yeah. thank you so much for joining me and bringing back those memories because we need to Skype once in a while. I mean, we need to um, Zoom once in a while. We'll just sit and talk to each other and Please, just dish. I would love that. I would love that. Or just a, on 57th Street, let's find a restaurant. And when exactly. it's safe, they still just, exist. They, yeah. Molly Vos is gone, but others still exist. It's gone. It's I closed the hotel that Molly Vos was in, so now it's gone. Uh, what about Trattoria? Is that gone? Broderia you know del Arte. They okay. It's them, Brooklyn Diner, and that other like the other place that had the lobster on the wall. Those three places were like during the pandemic. One was open, one was closed. So Trattoria del Arte with the fabulous thin pizza might still be there. Might still be there. Well, maybe a reunion there. So there um, go. anyway, thank you, Carol, and thanks. And again, anybody next Tuesday, six thirty, Symphony Space. Check out the list of bookstores, and if. Uh, you pre-order a copy and come via live stream. I would love to see you there. So thank, thank you. you. And thanks, Carol. I appreciate it. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to. And don't forget, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You do that. Never miss an episode. Same thing with the podcast. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you, Carol.